I'll say one thing about my county agents in West Virginia. Uh, working with them and the things that they've done for me uh, allowed me to accomplish what I have accomplished. So, don't forget that. <laughs> so, pasture forward, the pasture finish, uh, for pasture finishing deep. The right, right side of that circle, Ed. There you go. Thank you. We want to begin with the end in mind. Uh, if we're going to try to accomplish something, we have to know what we're going to accomplish. First of all, finished beef means fat beef. I think after that, you know, our keynote speech today, you might not disagree with that. Uh, a lot of people grow beef on pasture, but they don't really try to get them finished. So, finishing means fat. Uh, fat's helpful in aging the carcass. If that carcass isn't fat, does not have enough fat cover, you're going to have ex excessive shrink on that carcass because of water loss. The other big issue, uh, if you don't have enough fat, that carcass is going to chill off too quick. And you're going to have you know, chill toughening of the meat, which is not good. Fat adds flavor, uh, that enhances juiciness, and low-fat meat is difficult to cook. <clears throat> and if the meat is difficult to cook and comes out of the pan, no, not to be tasty, the person that's going to be blamed is the person that raised the meat, not the person that cooked <laughs> it. Okay. So, uh, body condition and finish. <clears throat> uh, I used to want to be a, a sausage maker. I still do make sausage for myself, but I was going to open a sausage kitchen. And one thing I learned real quick in making sausage, you've got to have adequate fat. If you have less than 20% fat, you cannot make good sausage. So good sausage has to have somewhere between uh, 20 and uh, you don't really want 30% fat in my opinion uh, because now we have so much fat it's going to start coming out of the product and being, you know, being left in the pan. But I would argue we need somewhere, uh, this, let's use the 23 and 26% fat uh, if you're making sausage or think a good quality hamburger. Uh, if you have down below 19% fat, you're going to have to add fat to the pan. No, just a fry hamburger. <clears throat> so, uh, think of it in terms of body condition. Uh, now, for a choice animal, we need a body condition score set. No, no, if we're looking at them from the outside. <clears throat> now, this is the USDA grading system, and what we know from a lot of research is that the higher the grade in beef, the fewer unacceptable eating events do you have. So uh, when you're up here in the choice and prime, more of those animals are going to provide good eating experiences. As we go down here to the low end, more of those animals are going to get a poor eating experience. It's not saying that you won't get good eating experiences here. It's just that you have a higher probability of getting fat. <clears throat> so that's why uh, we want to be shooting for, in, okay, I will undermine my opinion, okay? <laughs> because if you are raising beef to sell, you have to determine what does your market want. You know, if they want you know, lean beef, uh, that's what they're paying for, uh, then you, know, you may want to be down in this end of the range. But then, again, remember, well, okay, I had a fellow that wanted lean beef. <clears throat> uh, and I provided him lean beef because that's what he asked for. Then what did he complain about? <laughs> he, I, I, and before I gave it to him, I said, you know, this isn't going to be easy to cook. I, I gave him a disclaimer and, and he still came back and complained about the beef and I'm sorry. <laughs> so that's one challenge you have when you're marketing pasture finished beef. What do they want and 
what uh, are you willing to sell? So body condition score seven. Uh, no. The end of the spinous process, that's that process at the top of the spine. Uh, you know, it can only be felt with firm pressure. Uh, sp space between those processes are barely distinguishable. We have abundant fat cover on either side of the tail head. Some patchiness ribs are fully covered. Uh, you cannot feel the transverse processes. Those are the pieces, the bones that come off on the side of the uh, not where you have the full rib, but along the loin. Now, those short bones, uh, that's the transverse process. So those are fully covered, you can't feel them. You can have hind quarters that are nice and plump. So, uh, it's hard to take a good picture of a black animal. Sorry. <laughs> but here's an example of one. Uh, here's another one. I also like to see uh, you know, the brisket uh, the full. <clears throat> and I also don't want that brisket going in that hamburger. I want that brisket going as a brisket so I can you know, cook it and make you no know, uh, you know, uh, barbecue out of it. <clears throat> so again, if you want to have trouble taking a picture of a black animal, also do it in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> this animal was waiting for the trucker to arrive. Uh, and actually, the pictures would have been on the computer screen than they look up here. But that's what he looked like you know, once we took the skin off of it. Now, this animal was uh, about a three-year-old. Uh, I'm making no excuses for that. We know that uh, if we go over the... You've got to keep them under 30 months of age if you don't want to run into the issue with uh, you know, mad cow disease. Uh, uh, there's no way a grass-fed a grass-fed animal could ever get mad cow. Amen. Okay, that's a different issue, <laughs> but we still have to deal with that ruling. So, if you're selling this type of animal, and, and this is the old classical pasture-finished animal. If you go back to the 19 early 1900s. Before we had corn-fed feedlots, uh, many cattle were fed on grass, and they were fed to three-year-olds. And in West Virginia, high elevation West Virginia and Virginia mountains were a classic place for finishing cattle on grass. Uh, when I was younger, in my 20s, <laughs> uh, I met an older fellow you know, in, in, uh, around Blacksburg that could remember when they actually trailed the cattle off the mountain pastures, no fat cattle, off the mountain pastures of, of Virginia. And so this would be that type of animal. Uh, and you can see it's got plenty of fat cover. I was actually called a liar when I told them I did this all in the grass. Okay? Uh, now my butcher believed me because he likes my my business. <laughs> but he showed it to other people and they said I was a liar, that I must have been taking them uh, green. But you can see there's a little yellow fat there. And again, I don't apologize for that. There's a steak out of this animal. Uh, you could argue that I have too much seed fat. I'm not going to apologize for that. This animal probably was a little too fat. <clears throat> uh, but I tell you, I do eat fat, and that tastes just like butter. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I, uh, I'm not going to apologize a whole lot. Uh, ease of finishing: a heifer finishes easier than a steer. A steer finishes easier than a bull. Actually, I would not recommend finishing out bulls. Uh, you know, take them uh, up to a body condition score five and put them in a hamburger. Don't try to do anything else with them. Uh, genetics, frame size, you know, small frame is going to be earlier maturing uh, than a large frame. Uh, breed, uh, yes, Angus do have a reputation for marbling better, but if you look within breeds, you can find, you know, especially Simmental, you know, small, you know, smaller frame Simmental, and smaller frame Charlet uh, that have been shown to breed. You know, 
maybe almost as good as Angus do. And I'm an Angus person, if you so I don't mean to offend any Angus breeders here. But I am an Angus person myself, but I'm just stating the facts when we look at the research. There are other animals that can do it. Uh, uh, one of our speakers wasn't very you know, happy with EPDs. I do use EPDs, uh, and I think Teddy actually pointed it out. The problem with EPDs are too many people are looking for just, say, the upper end. Well, sometimes it's not the upper end that we want. Uh, and a good example is milking ability of an animal. If you always go in and pick bulls that high, have high milking ability, now you have automatically picked it, uh, heifers that, uh, that have a very high energy demand to maintain that milking ability. So maybe you should be looking at the bottom end of a trait instead of the top end. The bottom end might be where the good genetics are. <clears throat> so I will encourage using EPDs, but just know what the EPD means and how do you need to use that EPD on your farm. Because uh, I will never throw away EPDs. Uh, so forage quality. So <clears throat> frame score. Uh, we measure that at hip height, uh, and I would, I prefer the 12 month. And I thought of something here today uh, as I was preparing. Nope, I brought the rulers with me. Now come on, guys. Does anybody have a ruler other than me? I need it too. <laughs> okay, but you can <clears throat> set something over your working shoe. And let's just say it's you no know, six feet tall. So, you, so if you're uh, you no know, up here, uh, then all you have to do is measure down from that you no know, seventy you no know, two inches to the hip height and you no know, subtract the difference, and you've got the hip height of the animal. Uh, that's the way you know in our local Fox Cow project we did it was measuring from a known distance down to the hip. So lo and behold, this can be used for measuring cow height as well as pasture height. Yeah. <clears throat> I, would, I have to write a fact sheet on that. Yeah, I didn't do that. <laughs> so uh, in my life, I've, I'm usually stuck with frame score five. Uh, why? Because most of my cattle you know, end up going to a feedlot. Uh, and that's where the, you know, they want them. But if, uh, if you're not selling anything to a feedlot, then getting down into the spring score four is a good area to, to look at. Uh, three and two, like Teddy was talking about, uh, I'm not going to argue with them, but I can buy a, a few of these bulls will be in our southern bull test sale or Wardensville sale. And I will say this for West Virginia. Uh, I don't know of any state that has a better uh, bull sale program than West Virginia has. No, so uh, it's, it's a wonderful resource we have here. Think about using it. And uh, now most of your animals in the, the West Virginia sales will be in the five and sixes, but they'll be identified. I would stay away from the six. I would like the low end of the five, but I would have no problem going into the four if I were not selling any of my animals commercially. Okay, <clears throat> fat type and quality. <clears throat> now we talked a little about, bit about quantity, but people wanting pasture fed usually are looking at this uh, omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. They're also looking at conjugated linoleic acids and uh, transbacenic acid. Now, I always used to have the TVA there, and uh, in some research and articles, you're going to see that as TVA. But I was told that I'm being that the right term is basenic acid because basenic acid is a trans fat. So when you call it transbacenic acid, they say you're just being redundant. <laughs> now, the transbacenic acid, you all hear that, but Trans acids are bad. This is the that does not apply to this natural uh, transbacenic acid that comes in beef. This is the one acid. Uh, okay, there's fat, like you saw in that picture, 
of the uh, fat animal. And, and you may already know that the, a molecule of fat has three fatty acids on it. So, and you, you, in blood work, you hear triglycerides. So, uh, a fat is a triglyceride, and then if you break off those fatty acids from the, uh, the glycerin molecule, you all know what glycerin is. You take glycerin, you have nitrogen, you have nitroglycerin. Okay. <laughs> uh, so anyway, you get these fatty acids. Uh, CLA has been shown to be uh, something, a fatty acid that helps reduce the risk of cancer. Transvacenic acid is the one fatty acid our bodies can use to make CLA. So this is a good fatty acid. Cool weather forages in general have the reputation of having more omega-3 fatty acids. Corn has a lot of omega-6 fatty acids. <clears throat> now, in and of themselves, well, let's go to the next one. Uh, fatty acids and pasture plants. <clears throat> we do have a lot of omega-6 fatty acids in pasture plants. <clears throat> now, here's the simple way to look at it. Uh, we're saying, okay, little, this omega-6 is C18-2. And don't, don't worry about a lot of these numbers. Look at them in terms of relative value. So just think of this as a relative value. Uh, I get more of this linoleic acid uh, as I have more crude protein. So uh, crude proteins associated with good vegetative growth, right? The young material. Think of it as hay. If you cut hay early, you're going to have more crude protein. If you have cut hay late, you're going to have less crude protein. So I have a base value of fatty acid. As I have more crude protein, it goes up. <clears throat> but then I also have the effect of species and month. So bluegrass adds more than fescue. Fescue is you know, basically 288, you know, 2888. So that's why it has a zero there. Uh, orchard grass, we add another 200 or 2,000 uh, plus, and bluegrass 2,700 plus. Uh, ryegrass is low compared to bluegrass. Uh, May and June, uh, that's the base level. Uh, but if I go into August, I add more of this omega-6. If I go into November, I have less of the omega-6. So that's how to, to read that. We have a base level of omega-6. We're going to have more of it as you know, it's younger and more tender. Uh, some species have more than other species. Uh, some months are going to have more or less than the base months of May and June. So that's the omega-6. The omega-3, notice it's more. We had what? Well, just a little bit under 3,000. Here we have, you know, 3,500 is the base. But look at how much more is added by the grass species. Uh, a lot more based on the, uh, the, young, mater the young material. Uh, more crude protein, you know, we're adding 300. But we, we were only adding 100 there. So uh, as we add, protein in the forage, the omega-3 goes up a lot quicker. Uh, orchard grass is high in omega-3. Bluegrass and fescue are lower. Uh, so orchard grass and ryegrass are the high two uh, for the omega-3 fatty acid. August and November, look at November, you know, what November adds. Now I didn't know I was doing something right. I've always liked to take my cattle into October and November before I harvest them. And uh, partly because the animals tend to finish better in cool weather. I, if I manage things right, I have better quality pasture in cool weather. Uh, and lo and behold, I was actually you know, putting more omega-3 fatty acids into them. Uh, I didn't know that until last week. 
<laughs> but I've put this talk together. We did this research uh, several years ago. I just had not you know, summarized the data. Uh, now, this is kind of a busy table. Uh, we, and let me give credit here. Uh, this research could only have been done because of uh, friends of mine over in Maryland, uh, county agents, but in Maryland, <laughs> uh, that were doing this study. And they allowed us to come in and work with them and uh, analyze. Uh, I had a postdoc, Marcelo Wetzel, that did all the fatty acid analysis. And Tammy Webster helped us in the uh, fermentation profile uh, lab at WBU. So we had a lot of help here. Uh, now, these were samples taken in Preston County, West Virginia. This so happened to be my farm. Uh, so uh, we were looking at you know, grasses. We had tall fescue, smooth grown grass, and quack grass, and orchard grass. Then we had uh, forbs, uh, buckhorn plant, and common plant, and curly dock, and dandelion. And then red clover and white clover. And you'll see that you now orchard grass for the uh, uh, C18, that's the omega-3. Uh, no, it was very comparable to what we got in Maryland. Uh, so our, our grass is up in that, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, omega-3. Uh, up in that 2,000 range, our clovers are a little bit less. So it depends on the four, our curly dock and uh, dandelion are quite high in the omega-3. The buckhorn, the plantains, are pretty similar, but they're a little bit lower. Uh, and then on the omega-6, uh, no, again, our grasses are pretty comparable to what we found over in Maryland. Uh, the legumes, about the same as the better grasses, and uh, the, most of the, well, these two forms are higher than uh, the plantains. So, fatty acids and pasture, they're high in spring, they decrease with maturity, they increase from May to November in the vegetative aftermath growth. Uh, the omega-3s are high in August and November. The omega-6 are high in August and low in November. They increase with the leafiness, uh, they're high in the young vegetative growth, uh, and they are high in forages that have a good uh, food protein content. And one reason for that, most of these fatty, uh, the highest concentration of these two fatty acids are actually in the membranes of the chloroplast. So, piece of trivia. Now coming back to what gets in the beef. <clears throat> this was a, a study that Marcelo Wetzel did for us. She went back through the literature. <clears throat> these are the fatty acids. <clears throat> Don't worry about it too much. This is TVA, I talked about that. Uh, this, uh, no, CF, the total CLA down here. <coughs> Steric acid, well, let's come over here. Uh, we analyzed what was in feedlot beef animals. Uh, what we did is we just went down to the store and bought steaks out of the grocery store. Uh, these were pasture finished animals as, that were done as part of our project. <clears throat> Here's the important part. What was the heart health effect of these fatty acids? So here are all the classic fatty acids that in beef. Notice, if it's zero, that means it has no adverse effect, no positive effect. If it has a plus, that means it's actually heart healthy. Okay? If it has a negative, it might be, no, and have an adverse effect on heart health. <clears throat> Look at them, all of these. We have two that have, they're not good, they're not bad. We have two that are, no, considered bad. And this is the only fatty acid that I have never found any positive side to it. <clears throat> but it's no, pretty low. Okay, it is a little higher in pasture. <clears throat> uh, 
this one here might actually, I, I need to do more research on it, but from what I'm understanding, this may actually have positive brain effects no, in our diet. And no, brain is important, isn't it? <laughs> as well as the heart. <laughs> but everything else is positive from a heart health perspective. And I want you to know this, uh, this study was peer reviewed by a major scientist at Beltsville, Maryland to make sure that we didn't goof up in our, our research on this. So uh, bottom line, uh, just like Peter was talking about, most all of these fatty acids in beef are either good for us or don't have a negative impact on us. Okay, how many of you were in the uh, talk that I gave yesterday? Raise your hand. Okay, who, who was not in the meeting yesterday? Raise your hand. Okay, I got everybody to raise their hand. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, where did you get the energy for raising your hand? Come on, those of you who were in the meeting yesterday. The sun. Okay, what holds your hand together? The solar energy that you know, is in your body is what holds everything together. Okay? So, like I said, I want you to remember that. We are sunshine. Did you ever have a mom, grandma, or aunt that you know, saw you as a kid and said, Good morning, sunshine. Yeah. Uh, she was very correct. Okay. <laughs> so we have sunshine, we grow forage, we utilize the forage, the animal makes a product, and we market. And so we're converting sunshine to cash. <clears throat> and uh, plant height, and I had hoped to have a fact sheet for you. Uh, you can measure light interception based on plant height. And you can do that with in about 10%. So you will be receiving that fact sheet in the near future. The other thing to keep in mind is uh, when I graze off a pasture, this is rotational grazing. So that the blue line is forage mass. I graze off the pasture. It starts regrowing. Uh, what's you know, providing that energy for regrowth at first is the carbohydrate <laughs> reserves. And that's why they're going down, is because they're generating uh, energy for plant growth. And then with time, those carbohydrate reserves come up. <clears throat> now what we don't want to do is come back in here and graze that pasture again, again right here, unless you're trying to establish a new seeding, okay? Because if I regraze the pasture right here, I take off the leaf area, but now I have no carbohydrate reserves. How many of you have cut a hay field, baled hay three days later, and seen like two to three inches of regrowth on your orchard grass? Yeah. What generated that growth? Well, it was the sunlight stored as a carbohydrate reserve. And then, no, it, no that allowed that uh, grass to take off. <clears throat> That's also one reason I think you'll actually, okay, I recommend no more than a seven day stay, but I'll tell you that you'll see the difference in a three day stay. And I think part of that is because you are starting to get you know, some use of you know, carbohydrate reserves uh, that are getting adversely impacted by the cow. Okay, grasses are the foundation of our pastures. <clears throat> uh, so if grasses are king, legumes are the queen, and forbs are the princes, okay? Uh, we can't do, in my opinion, with uh, eliminating any of them. So there's orchard grass, you know, uh, late boot, early head, when we like to take it for hay. There's orchard grass when we usually take it for hay. <laughs> now, in orchard grass down here, this uh, the pseudo stems. Uh, so that part of the stem just below the true leaf, that's where we store our carbohydrate reserves in orchard grass. Fescue. Uh, fescue has a rhizome, 
lossless, no uh, basal pillar. Fescue stores carbohydrates in this two inches below the leaves, there are the leaves, so this pseudos then. Fescue also stores carbohydrates in that rhizome, so it has two places to store carbohydrates. Bluegrass, uh, very similar to fescue, just has a longer rhizome, so orchard grass is basically the bottom inch, uh, half inch to inch, and then this rhizome. Those are the carbohydrate reserves. Legumes improve forage quality, animal growth. Uh, in legumes, we have less neutral detergent fiber, no cell walls. Uh, we have more non structural carbohydrates, think sugar and starch. Okay? Uh, cattle will eat more forage if there's more legume in it. In general, adding legumes, and I'm only talking 20 to 30 percent legume in the stand, it's going to add between a quarter and a half a pound a day average daily gain to the animals. <clears throat> so that's what, you know, in terms of uh, a growing beef animal, that's what legumes are worth to you out in that pasture. And, I, and I'm talking that that. No, 25, 30 percent with you. I'm not talking 100 percent with you. Okay. Uh, our work here with the farmers and county agents on calves being backgrounded on pasture, we measured a half a pound a day gain. Roy Glazer, who was my major advisor back at Virginia Tech, <coughs> with uh, orchard grass, uh, they were getting uh, basically almost a, a quarter of a pound a gain difference between orchard grass clover and orchard grass fertilized with 200 pounds of M. Notice that the uh, gain per acre was almost identical. So the clover was producing an equivalent gain per acre of 200 pounds of M. So the humes also provide the nitrogen to the grasses and forbs. <coughs> Just showing you two different responses. Uh, the green lines, uh, green dots, that was on one site, and the uh, dark blue dots were on another site. Why the difference? Those are totally two different responses, aren't they? Well, lo and behold, this site had been, uh, you know, we'd grown corn for two or three years, and then we grew wheat on it. Then we planted the legume, a legume grass mixture back in there. So there was no organic matter in that soil. So the grass, we, we did not fertilize with nitrogen, okay? <clears throat> so the grasses in this stand had nothing, had no nitrogen source to grow on, <clears throat> uh, other than what they were getting back from the legume. And this was uh, the year after, no, this data was taken the year after establishment. Uh, so this is the first good harvest year. So uh, bottom line is, no, the legumes were very competitive no, compared to the grass. And to get your highest yield, we had to have the legumes in here. When we had low legume content, we just weren't getting the nitrogen from the legumes because uh, we didn't have enough legume in there. Uh, now over here, this was an old saw. We killed the sod and then planted the legumes into it, but there was lots of organic matter breaking down from that old sod. So <clears throat> here, uh, if you think this is you know, more like the sod that we're normally working with, uh, you know, there's a lot of organic matter that's being able to be turned over, and you know, we're, we maxed out on yield you know, just about at 20% legumes on, on that site. But, the difference is, what is the organic matter content in the saw? And you know, do we have a healthy turnover of organic matter in the saw, providing nitrogen to the grass? And then the legumes, you know, keeping that nitrogen instead of So, uh, my favorite, and I think it should be all of our favorite legume is white clover. Uh, if we lime and fertilize and graze properly, it's going to be there. Uh, and white clover, as you know, lays on the surface of the ground, the stem lays on the surface. 
It will put out these nice you know, uh, tap roots. Uh, and the nice thing about white clover, it runs around the ground looking for an opening, and it will put down a new tap root. If you lose a tap root on an alfalfa plant or a red clover plant, you lose the plant. Uh, white clover you know, keeps working for you. I do like red clover. Uh, uh, there's the tap root on the red clover. Uh, I just want to emphasize that here are where the bugs for red clover come out, right at ground level. Okay, so when I'm getting new growth, it starts at ground level. Alfalfa in West Virginia, and alfalfa is an also rain. Okay, <laughs> now if you have good alfalfa soil, what's good alfalfa soil? That's well drained, two feet deep. Then I won't uh, be critical of you growing it if that's what you want. But most of our acreage in West Virginia is not suited for alfalfa. And so I don't push alfalfa here. Uh, when I was in New York, I had a lot of really good subarrogated land. By subarrogated, I mean it had two to four feet of well-drained soil, but then a perch water table down there about three or four feet. And if it turned dry, the alfalfa didn't care. The roots would go down to the water table, and it was irrigated by that natural water table down below. I had another piece that was 12 feet deep uh, gravel, but I, I actually, when they dug a pipeline through there, <laughs> I could get in the trench and see the alfalfa roots going, you know, 12 feet deep, and then they kept going, you know, down to the water table there. So if you have the right site, alfalfa is a miracle plant. But I'm just saying that uh, the miracle in West Virginia is white clover and red clover. Uh, they'll still produce the equivalent of a uh, gain of 200 pounds of M on our orchard grass. Birds of the tree foil, uh, it's a legume I love. Uh, our goat herd was named tree foil meadows. <laughs> so uh, I don't push this legume a lot. Maybe it's something that we ought to think about more of. Uh, it does take a, a different inoculum. Uh, so if you ever do try burst foot tree foil on your farm, make sure that you uh, add the appropriate uh, bacteria to get it to make nitrogen for you. Uh, so it's, it's a good option. But here's my ideal pasture mix for West Virginia. I've got red clover, I've got white clover, I've got, in this case, orchard grass. Uh, I like novel in the fight fescue or in the fight free fescue. Uh, I do like bluegrass, uh, just don't see it in here. Uh, we also have another group of grasses, the, the other bluegrasses, uh, that are really bent grasses. Uh, most of us just look at the fine leaf grasses and we call them bluegrass. But uh, I've worked, some work done here in Morgantown found that about half of these fine leaf uh, grasses are actually red top bent. So uh, I just want to give bent grasses credit, okay? <laughs> but the florals, uh, dandelion, plantain, uh, no, they're very important. Just wanted to show you economics. Here's a study done on a West Virginia soil that happened to be over in Tennessee, but it, I mean uh, Kentucky, but it was a, a soil typical of West Virginia. Uh, <clears throat> so we had fescue and Madonna clover over four years. Uh, look how little difference there was between yield for fescue clover and versus fescue fertilized with 120 pounds of M. So uh, the, net return, the marginal return from M, uh, year one, two, three, and four, average just a little under 700 pounds you know, for about a third of the ton. At 120 pounds of N, and I said this costs $72 per acre, that's roughly 50 cents per pound of N plus a little cost for getting it put out there. The marginal return, you no, know, you are paying $200 per ton of additional hay. Is that good economics? Say that louder? No. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
that's not good economics. <laughs> so I, that's what I'm, I'm just trying to emphasize. If, oh, uh, I didn't notice. The zero nitrogen stand in April only had 24% clover. That wasn't a lot of clover, is it? So what I'm wanting you to think about, if you have 20 to 30% clover in your stand, seriously think about not applying nitrogen. And this was even in the haystack. Now normally if you're growing no grass with you hay, we would encourage you to have red clover. Because red clover is going to make you more mass, isn't it? Than white clover. And this was Ladino type white clover in this study. So, uh, grasses and legumes need adequate fertility. If you're growing clover, you only need a pH of 6. Uh, if you send a soil sample in and the pH is 6.2, you will get a line, require, uh, a line recommendation. Because the line recommendation is for 6.5 for alfalfa. But just keep in mind that if you're at 6.2 and you're growing clover, you don't have to apply lime. Now, if you get funding from the conservation district to apply lime, I'm not saying don't apply lime, okay? It's not going to hurt you to no, have 6.5 for clover. But if you're having to pay the freight on your own, uh, wait until the pH comes down. I, I would say 5.9. When the pH comes to 5.9 in a clover stand, add two tons of lime. Okay? The lime requirement to go to 6.5 is going to be three to four tons. But you no, know, again, if you're managing clover, uh, keep it above six. I'd like the P, K, and magnesium in the high range. Uh, why? Legumes are less competitive for K than grasses. So I've got to have enough potassium there so that my legumes are not having to fight with the grass to take up potassium. Legumes also take up more magnesium than grasses do. Uh, something we haven't done, and I fault myself a little here, uh, legumes do respond, no, legumes beyond alfalfa do respond to more. Actually, if you go into North Carolina in the mountains, they have documented that our clovers respond to more down there. Uh, Penn, Penn State and Cornell would say that they don't, but I have farmer testimonials that say they do. Uh, harvest height, uh, uh, we recommend two to three inch stubble. Uh, actually, the stick says uh, in cool weather, two inch stubble. Now, if we're trying to stimulate the yields. Uh, the thing that the legumes really respond to is a good rest interval. If you're alfalfa or red clover, we like a five to six week rest interval. If you're with white clover, you can cut that back easily to four weeks. But if you've got red clover, five to six, we like the legume to be an early flower. Okay? Uh, we can try to stimulate, no, uh, increase the legumes through frost seeding, no till, walk in, minimum till. But the big thing that we need to do is don't put nitrogen fertilizer out on a stand where you've done the frost seeding. What's going to happen? I go out in February and I put out legume seed. Then I come back in April and I put out nitrogen. Tell me what's going to happen. You know. Pardon me? Burn it up. Okay, burn it up might be one thing. If Yes, if I use urea and I get too much ammonia there, what else is going to happen? The grass is going to grow and smother those baby legumes, right? Those little legume seedlings are going to be about that tall. If this is the soil and I get grass up like that really thick, they're just going to get smothered. Now, so I'm just saying, if you're gonna if you're gonna use the nitrogen, don't don't waste your money on the legume seed. Or the other option is only do a frost seeding on if if it's hay ground, okay. If it's hay ground, only do a frost seeding every uh, three to four years on say a third to a quarter of your hay land, 
and don't do it nitrogen on that part of the halide. And then the next year, you're not going to need the, the nitrogen because now I have a good, healthy stand of clover in there. And so that's one way to, you know, to change from a nitrogen-based system to a clover-based system is do it a little bit at a time, you know, one field at a time. Don't try to do it to the whole farm at one time because you'll have a train wreck if you do. Okay? <clears throat> uh, now we do have different growth rates in the year, so we've got to figure out how to get away from that. And we, the way we do it is having a buffer. So here's the growth rate of the pasture across the year. Here's our animal demand. If you have a cow calf herd uh, calving here in March, the calf gets bigger and bigger. I sell the calf. Uh, so that's the feed demand. There's the feed supply. Uh, we can make hay, but we have to have some type of buffer in the system. What are the buffers? Uh, the time, no, we can time livestock production to our production cycle. Uh, if you came back here in February, uh, March, sorry, January, you're going to have a lot more <coughs> feed demand in here, aren't you? Uh, now there may be grounds for why you do that, but you have to just handle it. So one way is to uh, put off calving so it's more in line with the forage production cycle. We can make hay and then graze the aftermath. And I think most of us should be looking at that. Uh, why make second and third cut hay unless it's on a field that doesn't have water, doesn't have a fence? Uh, you know, if you can graze it, uh, no, why not use it as grazing material and then you know, manage it so you have you know, grazing into the end of December instead of having to make hay and feed more hay. Uh, strategic nitrogen fertilization for stockpiling. You can you know, vary the stocking rate. Uh, and you know, cow calf producers are already doing that when they sell calves in the fall. You know, you're getting those calves off the farm. The other way people in West Virginia do it that are running stocker cattle, they'll bring in you know, twice as many you know, head as you know, they could graze late in the summer. They move half of them in July and August uh, you know, off the farm. So you have you know, fewer head later on in the season. Uh, adding legumes and deep rooted forbs help. We can use warm season and cool season for uh, you know, annual forages. Uh, we can have supplemental forage, and that's what you're doing when you're feeding the hay. You're, you know, that's a supplemental forage. If you don't do something up here, you're going to either waste forage or you're going to have to accept a difference in animal performance. This is the ultimate buffer in the system. Problem is, too many of us you know, fall back on what's going to happen instead of managing you know, what, we, you know, what do we want that. <clears throat> Timing and intensity of grazing. <clears throat> this is a, you know, from a 10 year average, and let's just concentrate on relative yield. And it's orchard grass and the dino clover, but this is under a simulated pasture. That fescue clover was a you know, hay system. <clears throat> the best response they got was you know, from a 10 inch you know, pre grazing height to a 2 inch post height. If we want, you know, if we only let the orchard grass grow to eight inches, we only lost three percent of our yield. Whereas if we didn't cut it down, uh, let's go back this way. If we didn't raise it to two inches, uh, we lost ten percent of the yield. Now again, that's built into the stick. Okay, <clears throat> uh, where you want to. Consider modifying that if you do have really hot, dry weather, then we have other things to consider. Uh, and so leaving that four inch stubble in hot, dry weather, that's what we're recommending. Uh, it makes it easier on the, the cool season grasses. <clears throat> the other thing is it's going to give you better regrowth once you get rainfall back on the farm. Now we've left you know, more leaf, 
Remember, the carbohydrate reserves are in that bottom two inches. But if I leave leaf area out there in that hot, dry weather, no, we're stock we're we're, we're stockpiling <laughs> carbohydrate reserves in those storage tissues, so that when I do get rainfall again, you're going to get really competitive uh, com compensatory growth in that pasture. <clears throat> so, but it, as long as it's cool, dry weather, uh, no, this no. 10 inches to 2 inches or 8 inches to 2 inches are a good management strategy for uh, orchard grass, Ladino clover, it could be red clover. Uh, one of my happiest days was a farmer I had not met who was speaking at a meeting <clears throat> and he, he taught the same principle with alfalfa. Uh, and I remember one of the agronomists at Cornell, his ears were turning red as all get out. Because he didn't like what he was hearing. <laughs> but the farmer was saying that if you want to maintain an alfalfa stand, you cut it a two inch height. Because that's what's going to stimulate, no, that's what's going to reduce the grass competition with the alfalfa. So this is something that you know, farmers have learned on their own uh, out there. So pasture value. Pasture quality is bad. I wish I had some cheerleaders. Give me a V, <laughs> give me an A, give me an L, give me a U, and give me a D. We want, <laughs> we want vegetative growth. <clears throat> we want it to be available. We've got a lot of feed there in front of the animal. Uh, and again, your rumor, I, pasture stick's going to give you guidelines here. If I have a lot of forage in front of the animal, I can have good intake and I can have good selective grazing. As I graze that pasture off, I'll still have good intake, but the uh, selective grazing is going to go back. And if I fall down below a, about a 1,200-pound forage mass, then intake is going to go down. Okay? So we do want to have plenty. Again, it depends on what type of animal you have. If I'm finishing a beef animal, I want them up here. If I'm running uh, backgrounded calves, I want them to be somewhere in this range. Uh, and now if I have a dry beef cow, I want her to be over on this end of the scale. So um, we can talk about that more some other time. I've been told I have, I'm skipping that slide because you have it on the stick, okay? <laughs> Legumes and forms. Uh, that's you can visualize uh, cover. That's 32 percent legume in the stand, and I know because we took the picture, we flipped the stand, and we hands up right it. Okay. <laughs> uh, so utilize it to a proper level. Now for a, that little heifer. She probably thinks she's getting starved. So really for her, that is not the proper level. But it comes back to this response curve. Uh, now what type of animal do you have? You know, fattening beef animals up here, stocker cattle, dry cattle. Uh, no. So what is the proper level of utilization? What animal do you have? And are, uh, what are you trying to do with the clover? Lower stocking rate? You'll, they'll give you bigger calves. But you want to manage in tune with the environment. And actually, no, that is not West Virginia, but we do have naturally growing prickly pear cactus in some parts of West Virginia. <laughs> the, if you get east of the mountains, it's a lot drier than if you're up in the mountains or no, west. We have summer finishing challenges, heat. No, with increased heat, we have lower forage quality. Dry weather, we have forage quantity issues, and if we have high heat, we have animal dry matter intake issues. But I want to just look at botanical class. Uh, here's day of the year. So 180, that's the end of June. Uh, just divide that by six. I mean, uh, 30. So that's six. So that's the end of June, that's the end of August, uh, no, July. August, September. So crude protein, high in clovers, you know, lower in the grass and you know, forbs, uh, you know, in the 
summer it's the lowest, then it comes back up. Uh, fiber, highest in grass, lowest in the grass, uh, legume and forbs. Non-structural carbohydrates, this is the one I want to get to. Uh, we, a lot of times we look at these broadleaf weeds or forbs, and think of them as bad, but they're actually bringing trace minerals we need, zinc and copper. Uh, if you, you need, if you want natural sources of zinc and copper, 10% forbs in the stand will provide it for it. So remember value, and it's come, no, it's determined by your management, maturity, soil fertility, and your forage species that are out there. And you want to do it all in tune with the time that you have. So, real quick rough, uh, summary. This is the beginning of a good meal from the cow's perspective. The first pasture, the beginning of a good meal from the cowboy's perspective. <laughs> good cattle. And there we have it from the consumer's perspective, you know, the steak that's going to go on the grill. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have some handouts here. Uh, firstly, to not hand them out. Uh, I may have more than 30 people here. If we don't have enough going around, uh, would you send me an email and I'll send them to you? Uh, anybody that doesn't have an email or uh, work electronically, please make sure you get them. Okay? Evaluation the table or the